Okay. Muted. So the topics that we're going to cover today include the date of this regulation. We're going to speak about the scope, who this applies to, and the new exposure limits defined under this standard. We'll discuss some of the exposing tasks and some of those that have been identified already by OSHA, but recognize that some of the tasks that you perform may not have been recognized or included by OSHA in the standard. That doesn't preclude you from having to evaluate those tasks and determine your workers' exposures. We'll talk about how to control those exposures, our housekeeping requirements under the law, and then Dr. Kaler will speak about the medical requirements under the law. We'll finish up talking about the training requirements and then our record keeping requirements. So our first topic are the dates of the regulation. As many of you know, this was finalized on March 24th of 2016. OSHA first began writing this health standard in 1973 and they continued working on and off throughout the different administrations until a proposed rule was issued in 2013. As Christina noted, I participated in the stakeholder meetings in 1999 here in Chicago. Like most OSHA regulations, the effective date then was 90 days later, which was June 23rd of last year. By doing this, OSHA has been able, in essence, to protect this regulation from any changes made by a change in administration. Um, many folks had thought that with the change in administration, there might be an executive order suspending or preventing this standard from uh, being implemented, and that's not the case. Nor is it possible for Congress to rescind this regulation. However, with the implementation date being June 23rd of this year, OSHA recognized that a number of contractors were having difficulty understanding and being able to be in compliance with the law. So they extended the enforcement date until September 23 of 2017. So there's been a 90-day extension on the enforcement and full implementation of the standard. In terms of the scope, OSHA has identified that any task that it could result in an airborne exposure as an eight-hour time-weighted average to their employees above the action level for the standard, this regulation applies to that contractor. And they set the action level at 25 micrograms per cubic meter of air. The exposure limits are also changing. So the action level is at 25. The permissible exposure limit is now at 50. And that, again, is as an eight-hour time-weighted average. Since 1971, when OSHA was put into effect, the exposure limit in construction is based on an old method of sampling and analysis that is completely obsolete and was never accurate. And it used an equation to calculate the allowable exposure to crystalline silica dust on the work, in the workplace. So using that equation, if we were just looking at the silica exposure, the current permissible exposure limit in construction equates to 238 micrograms per cubic meter. And this is still enforced until September 23rd of this year. As of September 23rd, the exposure limit is going to be 50. And that's a reduction of 80% of its current exposure limit, which is significant in construction. In manufacturing, as an example, their current exposure limit equates to 100 micrograms per cubic meter. So they will have the exact same exposure limit. It will be consistent now between the two um, industries, and their reduction is a 50% reduction. 
Now, to give you some frame of reference, the researchers at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health have calculated that if you take the weight of three quarters of a teaspoon of sand and you disperse it in the volume of the University of West Virginia football field, end line to end line, sideline to sideline, top of the goalpost, which is equivalent to 64,000 cubic yards, that mass per volume ratio works out to 57 micrograms per cubic meter. Now, although that seems like a very small amount, we have to realize that the exposures that we're concerned about are not the dusts that we can see. Visible dust will get blocked by your nose. What we're concerned about is particles that are microscopic, that are undetectable to the naked eye, that are small enough to get past your nose and mouth and into your respiratory system, what's known as respirable or free crystalline silica. So sand isn't an issue. The particle size, way too big. It's about 90 microns in diameter. But when we have materials that contain sand and we apply some physical force to it and we fracture those sand particles and make them small enough, less than 10 microns in diameter to get past our nose and mouth and into our respiratory tract, that's where we have a concern. So that three quarters of a teaspoon of silica would be fractured into billions of tiny particles dispersed throughout that football field. So under the law, an employer has to determine their workers' exposures, and OSHA has provided two different options to do this. The first is found in the regulation itself, Table 1, which is in paragraph C of the regulation. And what OSHA tried to do is identify several common construction tasks that will result in exposures above the action level of 25 micrograms per cubic meter. In addition to listing those tasks, in column two, OSHA has identified engineering and or work practice controls to reduce the exposure. And in column three of that table, OSHA has identified the need, if any, for respiratory protection to be added as an additional control. So we have our engineering controls listed, we have our work practices listed, and we have our respirators. And those respirators are identified based on their assigned protection factor. And I'll describe what that means a little bit later on. It also gives an employer an option of doing what's called an alternative exposure control. So that allows an employer to do their own air monitoring to determine what respirators may or may not be necessary based on the engineering and work practice controls that are used. So if we look at Table 1, we see some of these common tasks, such as stationary masonry saws or handheld power saws of any blade diameter, handheld power saws for cutting fiber cement board. And then in Column 2, we see, for example, that if we apply certain engineering and work practice controls, such as using integrated water delivery system that has a continuous feed to the blade, operating and maintaining tools according to the manufacturer's instructions, or we use some sort of commercially available dust collection system, and you'll see that the dust collector must provide airflow recommended by the tool manufacturer or greater have a filter efficiency of 99% or greater, it will determine in column three whether we need to wear respiratory protection or not. And they divide column three based on the amount of time that your employees may be working on that task. So will it be less than or equal to four hours per shift? or will it be greater than four hours per shift? And in some instances, we'll see that regardless of the amount of time performing that task, such as stationary masonry saws with water to the blade, no respirator would be required. 
that becomes important when Dr. Kaler speaks about the medical evaluation portion, the medical surveillance requirements under this standard. You can see with our handheld power saws, if it's less than or equal to four hours, when used outdoors, no respiratory protection is required if we're using water delivered to the blade. But if we're going to be doing that for greater than four hours, then we would need to use a respirator with an assigned protection factor of 10. Or if we're using it indoors or in an enclosed area, we would have to wear a respirator regardless. So as I mentioned, this table was created by OSHA. It has common construction tasks that can result in exposures that exceed the action level and possibly the PEL. So column two defines engineering and work practice controls. Column three will tell you if those are sufficient enough so that you do not have to wear a respirator or under the conditions by which you would still need to wear a respirator. So other tasks identified, walk behind saws, drivable saws, rig mounted core saws and drills, handheld and stand mounted drills, including impact and rotary hammer drills. And so if we look at our controls, we use commercially available shroud or cowling with dust collection system operated and maintained in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. It says that the dust collector not only has to have the recommended airflow and filter efficiency of 99% or greater, but it also has to have a filter cleaning mechanism. And that is a vacuum that either vibrates or strikes the filter to release the accumulated dust cake. So those are special vacuums that you would have to use for that type of tool. And you can also see that for cleaning out the holes after drilling, you would use that HEPA filtered vacuum as opposed to using compressed air. We see with dowel drilling rigs for concrete, their specifications including using a HEPA filtered vacuum when cleaning holes. Vehicle mounted drilling rigs for rock and concrete, jackhammers, handheld uh, power chipping tools where we can either use water delivered to the bit or we can use a commercially available shroud and dust collector. And it again gives us specifications on how that vacuum system has to work. We see handheld grinders for mortar removal, for example, tuck pointing, handheld grinders for uses other than mortar removal, such as our finish grinding, walk behind milling machines and floor grinders, small drivable milling machines, uh, less than a half lane, our large drivable milling machines, half lane and larger, our crushing machines, heavy equipment, utility vehicles, used to abrade or fracture silica containing materials, heavy equipment, utility vehicles for tasks such as grading and excavating, but not including the previous category. And you see for most of these, if you follow the controls, there is not a requirement to wear a respirator. To help visualize what some of these pieces of equipment look like and the need, if any, for a respirator, the Laborers Health and Safety Fund of North America has taken Table 1 and added graphics to it. So you can see what these tools look like and what type of respiratory protection you may need to wear. Now the other option that a contractor can do is actually do their own air monitoring. If you choose to do your own air monitoring, OSHA has specified the method of analysis and it is in Appendix A of the standard. So whatever laboratory that you use, you have to ensure that you're following the same analytical procedures as specified in Appendix A. If you send your result or your samples to an American Industrial Hygiene Association accredited laboratory, that is a good step to ensure that you will be in compliance with Appendix A. If you do your own exposure monitoring of your employees, you must notify your employees with the results. That has to be done five days, and although the standard says after the exposure assessment, what this means is five days after the receipt of your laboratory results. And laboratory results typically take at least a week 
under normal turnaround. You can always get results much quicker, but you pay upwards of twice the amount of the analytical fees. Now, you can notify your employees individually in writing, or you can post a roster in the work area listing the employee's name and the measured exposure. In addition, if your results come back greater than the permissible exposure limit, then you need to include a description of what additional controls you're going to try to reduce the exposure below that permissible exposure limit. Now, one of the reasons why an employer may choose to do air monitoring may be because their tasks are not listed in Table 1. So if you're performing a task for your work that is not listed in Table 1 and you suspect it might put your exposures above the action level, you need to assess that by doing your own air monitoring. Another reason that an employer may choose to do their own air monitoring is the tasks that are listed in Table 1 using the specified controls may indicate the need for respiratory protection. If you have or believed to have better control than what Table 1 specifies, you may decide to do your own air monitoring to document and to prove that. So your own air monitoring data is considered data that you could use for your exposure assessment. You can rely solely on Table 1 if the tasks that you're performing are listed there and you feel that's sufficient. If you do follow Table 1, OSHA cannot issue a citation for exposures above the PEL. That's one of the things that that table precludes OSHA from doing. So if you find your tasks in Table 1 and you're going to use the controls, including any respirators if specified, then you have met the intent of that standard to evaluate and control your worker exposure. But again, if your task isn't there or you feel you can get better control to where you don't need to use respiratory protection, you would need to do air monitoring to prove that. Now, OSHA also allows the use of what's known as objective data. And that objective data may include previous air monitoring that you may have performed, or it may be data from an industry-wide study uh, I believe some of the tool manufacturers are developing data sets to share with their customers, and those would be approved as objective data to use for your exposure assessment as well. With any type of air monitoring, employees and, their, and or their representatives are allowed to observe the monitoring to ensure that it's being done accordingly. In addition, if you're doing any sort of blasting operations, abrasive blasting, we need to identify our engineering and work practice controls and the respirators that we use in terms of the quality and the airflow to those hooded or helmeted respirators have to be in compliance with 192657. On the right, you should see a brand new device that is not yet available. This was developed by NIOSH. It uses infrared technology, and it allows you to collect an air sample and at the end of the day have it analyzed immediately for the concentration of silica dust present on that filter. So yet, not yet available, but at some point in the near future, this should be either able to be purchased or rented for you to be able to do in-the-field analysis of your worker exposure. So our tasks that we typically see in construction include any sort of cutting operations of concrete, grinding operations onto the surface of concrete, our sawing operations through it, drilling operations into it, crushing of either uh, demolished concrete materials or stone, abrasive blasting operations. If you're using sand as your blast agent, that can fracture it and create a respiratory silica concern. If you're using a different blast agent, whether it's steel grit or black beauty, glass beads, anything else that you blast against concrete, 
that can re, uh, produce respirable crystalline silica as well. Our road building activities. In asphalt, we have aggregate. That aggregate, when it gets milled, can produce respirable fraction of silica dust in the air, as well as any uh, removal of concrete road surfaces. But then there are other tasks. So you may be performing tasks such as um, wire cutting of concrete or wall sawing are some other tasks, as I mentioned, that are not listed in Table 1. A common task that's being done, especially in high-rise construction, is the sanding of drywall mud. And those muds typically contain silica. And that sanding operation can produce respirable crystalline silica particles that exceed the new OSHA permissible exposure limit. So how do we control these exposures? Well, if we look at our hierarchy of controls for occupational safety and health, our first step to control it is to try to engineer it out. Our second step, if that's not effective at keeping our exposures below the legal exposure limit, is to apply some administrative or work practice control. And our last line of defense, if these two aren't sufficient, is to use personal protective equipment. One of the things that every contractor has to have, then, is a written exposure control plan. And OSHA requires that it includes certain elements. And one of the first elements is that there has to be named a silica competent person. So we need to have, for our companies, an individual who has specialized training to recognize and understand the risks of exposure to crystalline silica, and then has the authority to take corrective action. They have to perform frequent and regular inspections of the job sites, materials, and equipment, and they need to be responsible for implementing this written exposure control plan. We need to have a listing of our exposed tasks. So if you're using table one, just copy the entries out of those three columns and put that as your exposed tasks. If you don't have a task that's in Table 1, then write what that task is. And in the next column, what controls are you using? And then lastly, what sort of respirator may be required? It has to include a description of those engineering controls, work practices, and respiratory protection for each task a description of what housekeeping measures that you're going to be taking, such as how do we restrict access to the work area. Now, unlike the general industry standard and in the proposed rules of construction, OSHA does not mandate the use of regulated areas. However, we do have to limit the potential exposure to other trades by the work that we do that can produce respirable crystalline silica. We also need to minimize the number of exposed employees. So only those personnel that need to be there to perform that task should be in that area. We also have to list what our level of exposure is going to be. And that would include exposures generated by other trades. And so we have to make sure that if we're not performing a task that is exposing our employees to respirable crystal and silica, that we're not near another trade or company that's performing tasks that could potentially expose our employees in a secondary fashion. It shall also be reviewed and evaluated in terms of, of its effectiveness, at least annually, and then updated as necessary. And that plan has to be made available for examination and copying, which means it has to be at the job site. Now, I've been recommending to clients that they develop an overall company silica policy or program, but that they write site-specific exposure control plans. At the end of my talk, I will show you a resource that you can use that makes it very simple for you to develop exposure control plans. We mentioned in the plan we have to identify what engineering controls we're going to use to reduce those exposures. So we can substitute. As I mentioned with abrasive blasting, we can use a different blast agent. 
we can provide ventilation to capture the dust as it's generated, or we could use water to take the dust out of the air. With water, we do produce a slurry, and that slurry, much like when we wash out our ready-mix trucks that deliver concrete to the job site, has to be treated and or collected and cannot be discharged directly into the sewer. There are a number of products out there that will coagulate and bind and separate those concrete particles from the water. A product, not as a sales pitch, but a product is something called Gel Max, G-E-L-M-A-X-X, -X, which allows you to collect those slurries and then treat them so that you can dispose of it properly. The waste that we generate, whether it's collected dust in the bags from our vacuums or if we treat our slurries and separate out the water from the concrete particles, is not either a hazardous or special waste. It is solely construction debris and can be disposed of accordingly. Now, some of the work practices that we need to follow and can use include employee rotation, body positioning, proper hygiene, and then, again, some of our housekeeping issues. So in terms of employee rotation, we see that column three, our respirator use, that OSHA has specified in table one, breaks out whether it's four hours or less or greater than four hours. This is a form of employee rotation. We can actually limit the amount of time that an employee is exposed to a task as long as the remainder of their shift is without silica exposure, and that would allow them to work with an eight-hour time-weighted average below the permissible exposure limit. In terms of body positioning, we should use prevailing winds, always at the back of our employees, and this is something that employees need to be trained to do to pull the dust away from their breathing zone so they're not potentially exposed. Now, that may not always be possible based on the nature of the work, but as much as possible, that should be a work practice that's adopted. As we talked about, we need to restrict access to the work area. OSHA falls short of calling these regulated areas, but we need to minimize the number not only of our own employees, but additional employees that could be uh, exposed, minimize their level of exposure, and again, other employees or sole proprietors. What this may entail is putting up some barrier tape and putting some signs. Again, in construction, there is no specified language for signage as there is in general industry. So an example of a sign that you may use would look something like this. And it's to identify that in its work area, work that's generating crystal and silica is present and that we need to keep unauthorized persons away. Now, our last line of defense, if our engineering and work practice controls are insufficient, is to apply personal protective equipment. So the personal protective equipment that we will use primarily, because this is primarily an inhalation hazard, is respiratory protection. We will also need eye protection, whether it's safety glasses or potentially even face shields, to protect our eyes and face from flying particles. And not that it's a risk of skin absorption, but just due to the abrasive nature of silica particles, it's a good idea that we also provide gloves to our employees to protect their hands. When we use respirators to comply, if our engineering controls and work practices are insufficient to keep our exposure below the permissible limit, we have to comply with the respiratory protection standard that OSHA has. Now, this is a horizontal standard. Even though it has a 1910 number, it applies in every industry trade or group that uses respiratory protection. Table one, as we talked about, specifies respirator use if the engineering and work practices are not completely effective at keeping your exposure below the PEL by the assigned protection factors, or APFs, of a particular type of respirator. Or if you do your own air monitoring, even with engineering controls, you may determine that you have to still use a respirator to reduce your employee's exposure. 
So if you don't remember the assigned protection factors of respirators, for disposable filtering face piece half-face respirators, they have an assigned protection factor of 10. This mask sits or fits on your face in such a way that it allows leakage at those contact points, and it provides protection up to, but not including, 10 times the permissible exposure limit, or what will be 500 micrograms per cubic meter. A half-face dual cartridge elastomeric or rubber face piece respirator with filters has the exact same assigned protection factor because it rests or sits on the face in the same location and leaks the same way. So a disposable respirator can be used for protection, but it has to be used in conjunction with a full respiratory protection standard. If you need protection greater than 10, although the table specifies an assigned protection factor of 25, I strongly urge you to use a full face piece respirator with an assigned protection factor of 50. 25 uh, is a number assigned to hooded or helmeted powered air purifying respirators, which if the battery fails or there's a malfunction, cannot provide you a tight face seal and they are significantly more expensive than a full face piece respirator. And if necessary, if you have significantly high exposures, you may need to use a powered air purifying respirator, but I don't believe that will be likely with silica dust exposure. OSHA assigns it an assigned protection factor of 1,000. NIOSH only assigns it a protection factor of 50. The filters that we use need to be high efficiency particulate air filters, so they're either N100 or P100 filters. They have a 99.97% efficiency, and typically you've seen these as either by being pink in color, magenta, uh, or purple in color. With housekeeping, no dry sweeping is allowed of material that contains respirable crystalline silica. So if you perform the task and you have dust that's accumulated because your engineering control wasn't sufficient, you cannot then sweep up that crystalline silica dust. It doesn't prohibit sweeping of any other materials. No dry brushing for the exact same reason, unless these following are not feasible. Either wet sweeping, where we water it down, or using a HEPA-filtered vacuum to collect the dust. Oiled sawdust and other sweeping compounds can be used, but there is a concern that that oil may damage concrete floors, especially if there's a finish that needs to be applied to them later. And any other method that you may devise that isn't going to resuspend that dust into the air. It's one of the reasons why we should also be vacuuming and treating any slurries that we create, because if they dry out, there's a potential when we go to clean them up that they can resuspend those fractured respirable silica particles. No compressed air for the exact same reason. We cannot resuspend this silica dust. So we should vacuum that out. So we cannot use this for closed cleaning. We cannot use it for cleaning surfaces. The only time we can use compressed air is if we are also using a vacuum system that collects the dust that we generate so that it isn't potentially exposing our employees. Or there is absolutely no other alternative method that's feasible. And just a quick note on feasibility. If technology exists, in OSHA's opinion, it's feasible regardless of the cost. This now brings us to the medical surveillance portion of the standard, and Dr. Kaler will go into great detail about what's required there. But a quick note, using a respirator for 30 or more days a year is what includes your employee in that medical surveillance program. So we talked about table one, we talked about doing your own exposure monitoring. If you can show 
that your tasks with your controls do not require a respirator, then your employees would not be included in this medical surveillance program. So what drives or includes your employees in medical surveillance is the use of a respirator for 30 or more days a year. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kaler. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. Great talk. Lots of good information. My topic is the medical side of things. And if you have any questions, certainly uh, uh, put them in the chat box. Or Christina has my contact information if you'd like to get back to me later. So silicon, silica is referring to silicon dioxide, the molecular structure shown there, not that that matters much, but at least for interest's sake. And John's already talked about the sources of it and the type of workplace setting, so I will not spend time on that. The disease we're talking about is silicosis, which is a severe, irreversible, fibrotic-type lung disease. There's three different types, chronic, accelerated, and acute. Chronic is after 10 years plus of exposure, lower level exposures. Accelerated is five to 10 years, and acute can be six months to two years. And acute is usually fatal and accompanied by significant shortness of breath, coughing, uh, lost appetite, weight loss, et cetera. Accelerated is the same, but less severe. And chronic, of course, is longer term. So individuals with the two accelerated and acute, they're going to be very obvious right away that there's something severely wrong with them. So that's really not going to get missed. But the chronic condition, the chronic development over time, is really what the standard is driving at because it's subtle and indolent in its uh, development. So prevention is the absolute key to this whole problem, which is why the standard was developed. So um, the level of exposure, I hope there's nobody would ever have a level of exposure that would ever cause acute or accelerated silicosis. Nevertheless, I want you to be aware of that because it exists. So what are the objectives of the standard? Obviously, to protect workers from developing silicosis or ag aggravating or activating existing disease, in particular tuberculosis, because there's not only the issue of the individual who would have reactivation of pre-existing tuberculosis, but the public health feature uh, related to spreading into other people. So uh, there's a public health um, interest here as well. Aggravating existing disease, such as someone's already a smoker, they have some de degree of chronic bronchitis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, otherwise known as COPD, and uh, silico silica exposure will aggravate the existing disease and raises a very significant specter, which I'll talk about, would be legal exposure to these things occurring. Identifying risk factors, they want the clinicians who do these evaluations to be aware of risk factors and uh, advise the worker regarding, hey, you're a smoker, this is a big concern, you should quit smoking or whatever it might be related to the risk factor. Could it be renal disease or other uh, conditions they might already have? It's incumbent upon the medical providers to identify that and notify the worker. Identify already existing silica-related disease, that's a no-brainer hopefully picked up on physical examination with uh, oscillatory, oscillatory findings or chest x-ray. We'll pick that up. And to initiate assessment and treatment for silica-related disease, if such is identified that there is a mandate to refer to a board-certified pulmonologist or a board-certified special in occupational medicine. Next is to recommend intervention. So if there's some changes need to be made, of course, they make those changes. So there's a lot here in terms of what they want to occur, all of it being to the benefit of the worker. So the evaluation, the provider will perform a thorough history regarding all the pulmonary-related conditions. And so our forms, for example, have those in it so that it's user-friendly for our providers, are able to take a good history, perform a good examination listening to the lungs carefully, identifying for signs of pulmonary disease, clubbing of the, of the fingernails, where the fingernails curve 
over in sort of a dome-shaped deformity of the fingernails is a sign of chronic hypoxia, chronic uh, lung disease. It's a very specific finding that can't be missed. Cyanosis, um, accessory muscle use for breathing, those kind of things we can note on exam. Spirometry, you're aware of this with respirator surveillance, but it's a dynamic test for pulmonary uh, performance and is rather sensitive in picking up findings such as obstruction or uh, restriction on the spirometry. The chest x-ray, ILO B readers have to read these. They report out the result. Any result greater than 1 slash 0, which relates to the distribution or the profusion, they call it, of small opacities on the upper lung fields in particular, could trigger a 1 dash 0 or greater finding. In essence, any finding of a small opacity on a chest x-ray by an ILOB reader would require pulmonary consult or occupational medicine consult in that regard. TB skin testing, this is a big deal related to activation of pre-existing TB disease, which I mentioned. And this is required on all initial examinations and the follow-up in uh, three years. It's not required. However, if the clinician deems risk factors present, they could require annual TB skin testing if they wanted to. So be aware of that. The TB skin testing does require a second visit to have it read within 48 hours, 48 to 72 hours. And so uh, keep that in mind. This means that all the workers will need to come back a second time to be, uh, to be read. Other uh, testing or evaluations is at the discretion of the medical provider, which could be blood testing, for example, for renal function, uh, could be a more frequent testing, annual instead of uh, every three years, that type of thing. So they give a lot of leeway to the medical provider and will hold them accountable to discovering and monitoring findings. Associations, this is important because the medical provider has to detect a prior, you know, they should get in the history of prior tuberculosis disease, current existing COPD, renal disease, autoimmune diseases. They found with silicosis they can actually have their inflammatory markers or the markers for these conditions to be positive from the, the effects of silicosis. Well, in effect, what it does is it can actually trigger autoimmune diseases. It can create a situation where the body's immune system starts to attack its own tissues as a result of being exposed to silica. So that's a uh, very uh, interesting phenomenon and continues to raise this whole idea of, of legal liability for having individuals exposed to silica in the workplace. Lung cancer, same thing, that weight loss, hemoptysis, coughing, those things that correlate directly with what you'd find with silicosis could, could be lung cancer developing, so it requires the clinicians to be uh, alert. The associations, associated conditions that I've noted here are all made worse by smoking. So smoking in parallel with silica exposure is particularly concerning and raises the thought that you should, each of you should consult with your counsel, legal counsel regarding what your legal exposures here are and the concern about should you have smokers working around silica? It's a good question that only you and your, your legal counsel should determine, but it's very concerning to me looking at this. It's bad enough already, but if you add smoking to it, it raises the potential three to 30 times greater for developing these conditions. So really, is it, you know, there's a past, the, you know, prudent man rule should we expose people or the general duty clause of the OSHA Act? Should we really be exposing workers who smoke to silica? Here's a, a healthy uh, chest x-ray. Uh, you can see the heart in the middle, shaped like a heart, and the lung fields are black because that's the color of air on a chest x-ray. And you can see some markings there relate to the large blood vessels and large bronchi around the heart. And then you see this. Look at that. It's a lot different. So those both are examples of silicosis. Note that the upper lung fields are more affected on the left picture because when you aspirate or breathe in, 
substances, be it fungus, bacteria, silica, airborne, particulate matter, it tends to go to the upper lung fields because those sections of the lung exit the trachea earlier, and they tend to go to the upper lung fields because of that, that just as a side. But you can see on the right, that picture is pretty devastating. That individual is debilitated in terms of being chronically hypoxic. There's not enough good lung field there to transmit adequate oxygen for normal physical function. That person has severe disease. What's required of the employer, and again, this is, seems to be pretty onerous to me, but it's between you and your, your whole process to develop this, and work with your medical provider, which obviously we're willing to do so, but you need to have a description of former current anticipated duties as it relates to respirable silica. And so um, you could review those regs in detail, but there's a lot of information you need to provide to the medical provider to do these evaluations, including PPE past and anticipated. So obviously some of this will not be discoverable the individual may not remember, I don't know what I used before, two, five years ago, whatever, but you have to do your best, and so you'll need to create forms, as John talked about in your entire program development. You will need forms that fulfill this requirement on all of your workers, so they should fill this out. You should check it, make sure they fill it out to the best of their ability. That's all you can do. And then records of employment-related exams that that needs to be available. So if there's pre-employment done, respirator surveillance, these other types of things need to be available in case the worker asks for them. I believe what they're getting at here is if the medical provider deems they need to see a specialist or other follow-up, they might come to you, the employer, and say, hey, give me all my information because I want this medical doctor to have everything that you have on me so that they can conduct a thorough and complete evaluation. The examinations, again, baseline and then every three years thereafter, the history of exam spirometry and NIOSH certified techs need to be doing this. So that's a new requirement that occupational medicine clinics like ours will need to comply with. And the chest x-ray, again, NIOSH B reader uh, 1-0 or greater requires referral. TB skin test or a blood test. You can do a blood test. It costs a lot more, though, and we can talk about that offline if you have an interest in the blood test, which would be one visit to the clinic instead of two because it's a blood test. It's not a skin test read. Any other tests or studies deemed necessary? Results need to be explained to the worker at the time of the evaluation and within 30 days a written report to the worker, which means we will have to gather their um, best mailing address to send it to them, and then if we're making a referral to a board-certified pulmonologist or occupational medicine specialist, that that is also related to the patient, explained to them in writing, and those criteria are noted there once again. But uh, the report to the uh, employer is a bit different, so the employer is responsible to make sure that the occupational medicine group does send a copy of the records within 30 days to the worker. So now you have to ride herd on the occupational medicine provider and that these documents are transferable across employers. So if the employee wants it, they can get it and if they lost it or whatever, they, are, they could come to you for it and so that they can take it to another employer if they like, even if you're paying for it. The employer is to receive written medical opinion from the occupational medicine facility regarding is there any alterations in their current use of respirators. So the clinic could come back and say, Joe is no longer qualified to use a respirator. And then you're left to wonder, well, what's that about? And you are not to be told the details of that unless the patient completes a HIPAA release to allow you to have that. And so they're trying to create a firewall between you and the worker's private confidential health care information, but I believe that most patients are going to sign the release. We're going to have it, uh, uh, we're going to have that, we're going to try to have that signed because we believe that 
I mean, they can decline it, but we're going to offer it. We feel that you should know if we have an opinion regarding a change in their exposure to crystalline silica. Because we might say they can use a respirator, but not silica anymore. There's a difference between using a respirator for other things versus exposure to crystalline respirable silica. Then you're notified of any referral being made and the date of the next examination. So you do get three pieces of information always, that is alterations in respirator use, any referral being made, and the date of the next examination, but not necessarily a recommendation on the change of respirator, uh, respirable silica. We are, however, able to make a general statement to you at any point in time that says, we have a reason to believe that you may need to look, take a closer look at your current silica exposure plan and silica remediation plan or whatever. We believe there may be an issue. And then you'll say, how so? And we'll say, well, we have information that we can't share with you, but that's our belief. And I realize that's cryptic and not particularly fair, but if the patient doesn't sign off on it, we can't tell you. But that's my interpretation. Obviously, I'm open to further interpretation or legal guidance. Maybe Christina would want to have a legal uh, webinar at some point here to go over, because this is really deep legal uh, things going on here in this standard. OK, back to John. Thanks, Dr. Kaler. So there is a training component under this standard, uh, under hazard communication. This would be the pictogram because of the chronic nature of the diseases caused by respirable crystal and silica. Uh, we have to ensure that our employees can demonstrate knowledge and understanding of the following. Uh, the health hazards associated with exposure to respirable crystal and silica, what tasks that your employees are performing that could potentially expose them, what engineering controls, work practices, and respirators are they required to use. In addition, the contents of the training section, be able to identify by name who their competent person is, the purpose and description of the medical surveillance program if they are included into it, and a copy of this has to be readily available without cost to each employee covered by the section. So one of the, the things that you may want to do with your competent person is periodically have them pull somebody aside and ask them some of these questions about what are the health effects associated with silica and do you remember going to the clinic and what those tests were that you performed. It's a way for you internally to check on their knowledge and understanding because when an OSHA compliance officer visits a site, it's not uncommon for them to pull a worker aside and question them specifically to gauge how well they know and understand what they were to be trained on. There are record keeping requirements under the standard. With any health standard, we've got to ensure that the medical information that comes back to the employer and the exposure data that's collected by the employer or through the use of objective data is maintained. So our exposure data and objective data, either air sampling we collect, table one, industry-wide studies, your historical air monitoring, um, air monitoring that's performed by your equipment suppliers, that data has to be maintained by the employer for 30 years. The results of the medical evaluation, the medical surveillance under this standard, as well as your last respirator evaluation for your employee, has to be maintained for their duration of employment plus 30 years into the future. Because of the chronic nature of these diseases, these records have to be maintained by an employer for that period of time. Now, some useful references that I think will benefit you in compliance with this standard. First thing you need to know is although Congress or the President can't affect this, and although OSHA has actually uh, pushed back the implementation and enforcement date, there are pending lawsuits against the regulations. 
the first lawsuit came from labor. And this happened on March 24th, the day the regulation was released. The North American Building Trades Unions filed in the D.C. Circuit Court. They were followed by United Auto Workers, United Steel Workers of America, the AFL-CIO, who all filed in the Third Circuit. Labor is not happy with this regulation because they wanted an exposure limit at 25 micrograms per cubic meter, what will be the action level. OSHA, because of how it has to write a law, needed to use the NIOSH recommended exposure limit of 50 or do their own research. Now, the NIOSH REL was created back in 1974. So that's what OSHA went with, and that's why the new PEL will be 50. But labor wished it to be half that amount, what the current American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists recommends. OSHA was also sued over this regulation by industry, and they were sued by the National Stone, Sand, and Gravel Association, who, in conjunction with its Georgia affiliate, filed in the 11th Circuit Court in Georgia, the American Foundry Society, and the National Association of Manufacturers filed in the 5th Circuit, and other ind industry groups had filed challenges in the 8th and 10th Circuit Courts. All of these lawsuits have been bundled into a single case that OSHA is defending itself against in the D.C. Circuit Court. So what the outcome of these lawsuits may entail is a change in parts or all of this regulation. However, this is very similar to what happened in 1989 when OSHA tried to lower all of their exposure limits as well as add new chemicals, that took at least three years to be resolved by the courts. So this won't happen anytime soon. And it certainly won't happen by September 23rd. So be ready when this standard goes into full implementation and enforcement in September. But recognize that going forward, the standard may change. An excellent resource that you can download from OSHA, and I've given you the web address here, is the Small Entity Compliance Guide for the Respirable Crystal and Silica Standard for Construction. And although titled a Small Entity Compliance Guide, it can be used by any size company. In it, it describes some of the things that we've talked about already in our presentation but also details some enforcement requirements that OSHA has or cannot do. It gives you visual pictures of the tools that, and tasks that they were describing in Table 1 and helps with your development of an exposure control plan to be in compliance with the law. In addition, the Center for Construction Research and Training, formerly known as the Center to Protect Worker Rights, CPWR. You can go to their website. They have a host of material about silica control and developing programs. The Electronic Library of Construction, Occupational Safety and Health, which is funded by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, and managed by CPWR has a guide for controlling silica in the workplace. If you've never been to LCOSH before, it is solely based on construction activities. You can search by task, trade, uh, type of exposure, or job site. They have the entire page translated into Spanish, and they have a host of materials, PowerPoints, uh, video, images, research documents, toolbox talks, a number of these they have in other languages other than English as well. A very useful resource, not just for silica, but for anything related to construction safety and health. CPWR has also created an online resource to help you develop your exposure control plan. And its web address is shown here plan.silica-safe.org. It also is completely free to use. You can register and create your account. You don't have to register 
and it will allow you to create a detailed exposure control plan. So as you can see, step one, will you generate dust containing silica on the job? And it has a list of tasks or types of material that may contain silica. And by checking one of those boxes, it opens up an additional box to describe or ask how are you performing that task. And then it guides you throughout the creation of a written exposure control plan. So the nice thing about this on-site or online resource is you can create site-specific exposure control plans. Now you can print them off directly, you can save them as a PDF file. If you've created an account, you can save that PDF file in the cloud so that when you need it to tweak it or adjust it for a different job site, all you need to do is log back in, call up a previous exposure control plan, modify it wherever necessary, and save it as a new one for that different work site. It's an excellent resource that is just terribly simple to use, and it guides you very easily to create your exposure control plans. Other resources, OSHA has a dedicated silica page at osha.gov slash silica. Uh, I am an outreach instructor for the Construction Safety Council in Hillside. We offer a number of classes related to construction safety and health, including a day-long class to help you with developing your exposure control plans. Uh, there's an excellent article uh, on Politico's website on why it took from 1973 until now for OSHA to create this health standard. And as you can see, my contact information if you have questions uh, going forward on how to get a hold of me. And with that, it's time for us to hopefully answer some of your questions. Thank you, John, and thank you, Dr. Taylor. I also want to thank our audience for attending, and hopefully you can stick around for our Q&A. Uh, I also wanted to let you know that we will be asking John back to do a competent training program here in our corporate office in Elk Grove Village. So I will be sending out an email sometime after the webinar this afternoon. It will contain a link to the presentation. It will contain the uh, wonderful re references that John included, uh, as well as information on the date and time for that competent person training. That is a four-hour training. It's a half-day training, and it will be here at our office. I would also like to let you know about a couple of upcoming webinars that uh, Corkill Insurance is hosting. The first is on May 3rd, and our guest speakers will be from Werner Ladder Company in anticipation of OSHA's stand down for fall prevention in construction, which occurs the second week in May. We will also be hosting a webinar on Road Check 2017. That will be on Wednesday, May 24th, and feature uh, Sergeant Lance Bonney, Illinois State uh, Trooper. So without further ado, I would like to open it up for uh, questions. And I believe we answered one of the questions from Chris B. Uh, Chris asked if OSHA's PEL aligns with the ACGIH uh, level, and I think the short answer to that is, is no, um, that it's that's correct. The new PEL is going to be twice the ACGIH level. The new action level will be at the ACGIH recommended threshold limit value of 25. Uh, we also have a question from John. Will uh, this PowerPoint be made available? Yes, it will. We will go ahead and send a link out to that. Also a question from Charlie. Why isn't drywall compound sanding listed on Table 1? That's an excellent question, and again, what OSHA does when they write these health standards is they often look at existing data sets or they contract with a consultant to go out and generate data to include in these uh, data sets. And apparently, for some reason, this was not included, but this is a recognized exposure source. NIOSH has research papers on the exposure. My own personal monitoring of clients has shown 
that during drywall sanding operations, exposures can exceed the new PEL. I can't give you a good reason why it wasn't on Table 1 other than that's not an exhaustive list. As I mentioned, you may be performing tasks that are not on that table, in which case you're going to have to do the alternative uh, exposure assessment and control strategy. Another excellent question from Charlie. Do N95 disposable respirators filter crystalline silica or are P100 HEPA filters required? Uh, and Charlie, that question is interesting in that OSHA doesn't specify that respirator filters have to be high efficiency. N95 respirators, the way the filter is constructed, the path of air is tortuous, meaning that it goes through all kinds of twists and turns. And so in theory, an N95 may be sufficient to block those particles. However, if you're going to use an N95 respirator, a disposable filtering face piece respirator, for control of an exposure above the PEL, it must be used in conjunction with a full written respiratory protective protection program, including medical evaluation and respirator fit testing and employee needs to be clean shaven. Now, both NIOSH and myself recommend that you use a HEPA filter for this dust. And so although you may be able to do that legally for best practices of protecting your employee health, both NIOSH and myself strongly urge you to use a P100 filter. A question came in from Terry. Can an employer require a chest lung exam x-ray prior to hiring an employee? And I think uh, Dr. Kaler is going to field, field this question. The answer is yes. You can perform any type of testing you want. It's how that information is used that matters. So feel free to do pre We do a lot of pre-employment screening. And if you, you, know, you already have to do the initial evaluation, so that's extensive. If you want to add to that other items, then you could have your occupational medicine group put that in your company profile to trigger additional testing at the time of the initial. I guess you could do it as pre-employment with the idea that may, they may or may not in the future work with silica. So again, it's what you want to do. If you say, well, we want everybody to have the initial even though all the things involved in the initial, even though they're not currently going to be around silica. You can do that. It's perfectly legal to do that. And a question from Ken. Employee exposure results must be shared with the employee within five days of the result. Do the corrective actions need to be a part of that same report? Again, the specif specifications are if you do air monitoring and the results are less than the permissible exposure limit, you have to notify your employees of those results, either directly or in a form of a roster. If the exposures exceed the permissible exposure limit, then you must also identify what steps are going to be taken to get those exposures below the PEL. And Brad asks, do you know of any testing done on mixing of dry cement powders, mortars, and grout in the tile industry? I don't know specifically. Uh, I have done some monitoring of that. What we're mostly concerned about with those materials are your exposures to Portland cement and not significantly to crystalline silica. Again, for that to be an issue, those materials would have to be milled in such a way that you could fracture that dust and it could become airborne if it contains any silica. Okay, and that will conclude our webinar. Again, thank you, Dr. Kaler. Thank you, John Demas. And everyone, have a great day. Woohoo! <laughs>